very much looking forward to continuing the work we've started together. The question this election is very clear. Who can you trust to help you and your family to get ahead? We're certainly not a one-issue party, unless the one issue is Canada. We're going to bring a message that is hopeful, that we can build the country of our dreams. Promises, promises. Are you ready, Canada? As our 43rd federal election rises to find the right candidate, do you feel represented or left out? Hopeful or skeptical? As our nation's political leaders crisscross the country, Context takes a look at the big issues that matter to religious voters, voters who often feel left out. And we'll introduce you to a new co-host for the show today on Context, on the campaign trail, issues through the eyes of the faithful. Welcome to a new season of Context, a new government for Canada about to be elected and a new co-host with us here at Context, Anne Romer, one of Canada's most trusted, tried and true anchors from City TV, CP24. And you've covered a few elections yourself. I have in my, what, four decades as a news anchor, uh, the good, the bad and the ugly never fails to uh, surprise me the outcome you know the polls will tell you one thing leading up to election day mm. and sometimes it's completely the opposite lots of missteps along the way when it comes to the leaders or some of the candidates but it is the fact that we have the right to vote it is the supreme <laughs> uh, I guess compliment when it comes to democracy and freedom okay the next compliment is our right to religious freedom in this country and on this program we are going to explore the spiritual side of the voters the spiritual side of some of the election issues do you think canadians want to hear that definitely and that i want to hear that and that's why i came to you lorna and said i really want to be a part of this show i think it's time <laughs> You know, each of us has our own spiritual path, but the fact that news and headlines and spirituality and faith can intersect and come together as a strong entity, that excites me. Well, and we have uh, requests out with all the party leaders to interview each of the party leaders about the issues and the values, the religious issues that shape their own lives. We have yet to get a yes, but you'll be the first to know as soon as we do. And uh, we're going to start, though, on this episode with the issues. So first, the controversy dogging Prime Minister Trudeau. The Prime Minister last night presented his apologies. He expressed his regrets. I think the real measure of the man, and the thing that I think that we need to be talking about, and I hope that you'll be talking about, or all the amazing things which we've done for diversity. Well, joining us to talk about the blackface, brownface scandal is digital pastor Junior Smith and Yes TV host Misha Watson, both from our Crossroads team. Do you both agree with what you just heard uh, and the apology from Prime Minister Trudeau being enough, Misha? Do I think the apology is enough for me? I think it's enough as in I can forgive someone and move on um, and allow him to move on, allow him to grow. Um, however, I think the conversation is beginning now. Okay, because a lot of people said, what's the big deal? He was just a kid. It was a drama. Junior, help us understand why blackface is a much bigger deal. We have to go back to the historical significance of it, which basically is to dehumanize black people. And when you go back and look at what it was done in order to bring a caricature of others, now it's done in this time. Um, am I going to put a, a bat to his head and hit him? No, but what is the significance of it? Mm -hmm. That is really where we get the true emotions behind it. Because when you go back and you see what it was done for, and um, you know many people have healed from that, and we look where we are now and we still see it, it kind of okay, digs you, deep. Okay, you used a strong image there a bat to his head because it was what the Klan, mm -hmm. Misha explained this, they used this to dehumanize. Yes, yeah, so the thing is with the Ku Klux Klan, if I was to today, 2019, see someone with a hood, I would be genuinely frightened for mm -hmm. my life. Um, and that kind of thing elicits emotions that are fear and uh, you don't feel safe when you see those kind of things in media. Seeing that, those pictures, those videos, frightened me, scared me. Unfortunately, it didn't surprise me. Okay, uh, both of you, you're going into the election as faith-filled voters, you're Christian voters. Mm -hmm. 
Will your faith affect the way you vote on this situation, Junior? My first response is forgiveness, because we have to do that. All of us have done something that we're not proud of. But does that take away the effect of the what comes after you've done something wrong, the consequences? So I've forgiven, but I'm watching. What is going to be the change in action? Because my forgiveness should elicit some decent response to what was offensive. And Nisha, will your faith affect how you approach this issue in your vote? I rarely vote, deciding on what I feel, feel that someone's, uh, I don't really think of politicians as a place I would go to for more the moral high ground. Mm. So I'm voting on what, his, uh, what he's standing on and what yeah, his policies. So it does change, but uh, it does uh, if, if affect it, but I've never looked at politicians as someone you should look to for who you should be as a person, more like what they can do for the people. All right, Misha and Junior, thank you both for being here. Thank you for thank having you. us. What will sort of decide your vote for the issue? I don't vote, I'm sorry. Well, there you have it. One man there not going to cast his vote this election. So is that a choice for a lot of Canadians? It is reported if millennials collectively get behind one party, they will heavily sway the outcome of the election. Here to talk about the current environment of Canada's 43rd general election is the executive director of the Angus Reid Institute, Shachi Curl. Thanks for joining us. Glad you're here. Thanks for having me, Anne. So based on your findings, what is the mood of the country at this point of the election season? Well, it's a divided country. So if you are someone living in Alberta who is frustrated about an inability to get uh, oil to market uh, because uh, the pipeline, uh, the TMX pipeline has, has yet to be twinned and, and has been bogged down in a number of uh, judicial and legal challenges, your mood is pretty sour. If you are someone in Ontario or in British Columbia who is part uh, working in, in the tech sector as part of a booming economy, uh, your outlook is focused on other things such as affordability uh, and uh, can I afford to buy a home? Can I even find an affordable place to rent even though I'm an educated professional? Uh, if you're a retiree in this country, you are thinking about and worried about access to primary health care and what does this election mean uh, in terms of your ability to afford prescription drugs, uh, to find a doctor, to shorten the waiting list you might be sitting on for surgery. Uh, and of course, across the board, especially with those millennials, as you were mentioning, uh, climate change really is at the top of their list. So this isn't an election where uh, four years ago you had the leaders sort of talking about one primary overarching theme, particularly Justin Trudeau talking about a couple of primary overarching themes. This is an election where, depending on uh, which audience the leaders are speaking to, uh, they uh, are in a situation where they, they really sort of have to tailor that message. In our last 10 seconds, can you tell me how one party can be all things to all people? Is that even possible? No, it's not possible at all. This is very much the niche marketing election uh, where you're going to find uh, the conservatives have a bit of an advantage uh, with older voters who have a higher propensity to vote. Uh, they will show up and they will show up for sheer. The challenge for, for that party is that it's having trouble growing its base. For the liberals, they have more room to play with among the left of center, but the challenge for them, of course, is ensuring that their base, that younger base, shows up to vote. Well, thank you for touching base with us as we are almost midway through this election campaign. Shachi Curl, Executive Director of the Angus Reid Institute, joining us from Vancouver. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Let's go over to Lorna now with a look at ethics and religious issues and our in-house faith panel. Well, there is a religious freedom issue in this federal election that has been strangely silent. And it is Quebec's Bill 21, how in one province in this country, we are not able to hold public office while wearing a religious symbol. Here to help us understand if we should be worried about this, we have Trinity Western professor Janet F. Buckingham, an expert and author on religious freedom in Canada, and Cardis executive president Ray Pennings, who has polled on these issues and understands religiosity in Canada. So let's talk about Bill C-21, because we have two federal party leaders who would not be able to appear in public leadership the way they do daily. Mr. Singh with his turban, Miss May with her cross. Janet, this really is 
uh, a religious freedom issue, isn't it? Oh, it's a huge religious freedom issue. When you realize that anybody who works for the Quebec government, that's on the payroll of the Quebec government, cannot wear a religious symbol, it, it covers a wide range of people. It's teachers, it's police officers, it's, it's even lawyers appearing in court, uh, being crown prosecutors, it's judges. Uh, and this covers religious symbols like crosses and turbans and also kippahs and hijabs. It affects so many religious people. And some of these are actual re religious requirements, particularly for um, a baptized Sikh, they must wear a turban. Um, and that actually includes women as well as men. Uh, but to tell somebody, because of your religion, you can't work in this type of job is a huge infringement of religious freedom. And we should be very worried about it. Okay, so uh, Ray Pennings, you have polled on what religious beliefs are meaning for our country. Tell us uh, what we know about how religious belief affects how we act as neighbors. So there's inter two interesting things that come from the polls. First of all, when you poll Canadians, we sort of have 20% who are very religious and 20% who are very non-religious, and about 60% are in the middle, one way or the other. What is interesting is most of those people in the middle do practice certain religious things. They may not go to church or religious, or, but you know, 67% of Canadians tell us they pray um, regularly. Um, in terms of teaching their kids about uh, a moral code that, that's based in a religious tradition. And you've broken that all down on how this actually affects our behavior. Let's take a look at your graph here. So what happens is we ask Canadians in terms of other religious groups, are they a net positive or a net negative to Canadian society? Are they damaging or are they productive in society? And by definition, anybody is, we asked about eight groups, nobody is going to identify with more than one group. What happens is the more religious you are, the more respectful you are of the contributions that are made, not only of your own faith tradition, but of other faith traditions as well. As you move along the spectrum from right to left on the graph, you'll notice that the 20% who are not religious actually don't think anyone else has been in net positive society except atheists. Okay, so Janet, this is um, a very interesting graph because to see that 20% of Canadians wish religion would go away would be a disappearing issue. What does it mean that we are not discussing religious freedom infringement in Quebec in this federal election, Janet? What does that mean? Well, pragmatically, I think all of the leaders of the parties are very conscious that they want to get votes. Uh, the Premier of Quebec, Premier Legault, has asked all the party leaders to affirm that they will not start uh, a legal case challenging the Quebec law. But apparently we know from other polling that the majority of Quebecers support Bill 21 and support restricting religious freedom of certain minority groups in the province. And so it's not an election issue because all the leaders are afraid of losing votes in Quebec. All right, Janet, thank you. And Ray, looking at our political leaders, you have Justin Trudeau and Andrew Scheer identifying as Catholic, Jagmeet Singh, of course, as Sikh, and Elizabeth May is Anglican. How does that faith background if a shape a voter, if at all? It's easy to focus on the leaders, and I understand the challenging situation that leaders are in. Um, I wish they would be more forthcoming in terms of their faith uh, in public life, but they also are in the business of trying to, to be elected, and sometimes that's challenging. I actually think this is more a referendum on Canadians, in terms of how Canadians view religion. You know, you've cited the data in terms of Quebec on how popular this is. Yes. I think the challenge is for people of faith as well as all Canadians to say, wait a minute, when we start attacking constitutional foundational protections like freedom of religion, it's tied to freedom of speech, freedom of conscience, all of our other yes, freedoms. First this isn't just about the private view of a few people.
Absolutely. This is affecting all of us. Okay, well, thank you for reminding us that this should be an election issue. It's not yet, except here. Ray Penning's executive director of CARDIS, Janet at Buckingham from Trinity Western University. All religious rights and freedoms are worth protecting, so thank you. And now let's go over to Anne for questions on disinformation and this election. Can you give us a question? Don't be rude. Can you no, give I'm us not a question? I'm you, not going to give you a can question. You can you stay categorical? You are fake news. Well, a now famous video there, President Donald Trump reigniting fake news, or as we call it here in Canada, disinformation, distrusting the media. It's a pretty common ploy for many politicians throughout history. Gordon Pennycook researches the subject of spreading false information, and he joins us from Regina. Thank you for being with us. My pleasure. So, Gordon, what is the difference between misinformation and disinformation? Um, so misinformation is something that's just wrong, uh, and it could be wrong just by accident or, you know, kind of trivially wrong, whereas misinformation is something that is deliberately false. And so, you know, the key aspect of uh, disinformation is that the person is trying to mislead you, which obviously is, uh, you know, much worse than just plain old misinformation. And then we have a Donald Trumpism. It's called fake news. Where does that sit in the overall landscape of news? So uh, a fake news story, the way that I use it and the academics use it, is a completely made up, like a fabricated uh, news headline that is presented as if it's from a legitimate news source. Uh, and so there's lots of examples of this. Um, so it's basically a form of disinformation. Uh, of course, other people use the term fake news to mean all sorts of things, but uh, you know, the actual technical use is just a made up, fabricated news story that's intended to mislead. And it could be misleading to potential voters. We have an election uh, about three weeks away, two and a half weeks away. Social media plays a really big part in all of this. How does the government factor into this in terms of responsibility when it comes to disinformation, fake news, misinformation? Right. So, like you said, the, these things tend to spread on social media. And the, the reason that it's like something that we're talking about that is something new, of course, you know, fake news, disinformation is not a new thing. You know, propaganda was spread, uh, you know, uh, uh, many times in the past. The the thing that's new now is that anybody can be the, uh, somebody who, you know, perhaps by no uh, knowledge of their own spreads disinformation online. Um, and so the responsibility of governments is really to force uh, the social media companies to take responsibility themselves, right? Because um, they aren't going to just regulate themselves. They, you know, the, uh, Facebook is set up so it, it drives engagement and what that leads to often is uh, people spreading disinformation. So if we, we can't expect the social media companies to just solve the problem themselves. It's up to the government to, uh, to, to pressure them to, to, um, to uh, you know, improve things on their platforms. Very quickly, what's the message for voters when it comes to misinformation? Um, double check. That is, you have to question not just uh, what you see on social media, but what you believe the most. The things that we tend to spread are things that appeal to us kind of emotionally. And so we have to think twice about what we're, what we're looking at and question our own intuitions and beliefs. Okay, Gordon Pennycook, thank you so much for joining us. And still ahead, top of mind for Canadians at the polls this election, ethics in government. A panel discussion is coming up. Plus, voters deeply care about environmental issues. Will they look to the next government for better policies? Well, climate is not only a political issue, people are so divided that it's almost becoming a religious one. So how does Canada's election involve climate action to help us try and figure this out, the significance and Canada's role as stewards of the earth is CEO uh, Luke Wilson. Nice to see you here. Thank you so much. Great to be here. Your organization, what do you try to do? Yeah, so our mission and vision is for the transformation of people and places by showing God's love for all creation. And we do that through conservation science, restoration and research. We do that through environmental education. 
and we do a lot around sustainable food. So we're living it out on the ground. So when you see someone like young Greta Thunberg and she is full of passion and uh, just so uh, completely climate crazy, but in a good way, I mean, she's putting her heart and her soul into this. What does that make you think in terms of our future in the hands of someone so young. Yeah, yeah. I watched the clip this morning, actually, Anne, so I was quite moved as well. She had that very intense, how dare you, right? And it, it is powerful. But I think the thing to recognize is she has captivated the hearts of the next generation. Yes. And uh, she has mobilized them in a way like no other. So we should pay attention to that. But and, they're uh, not the ones leading the way right now. They are our future. Right. right now, we are in a, a situation where we have an election coming up, and climate does come up from time to time as an election issue, mm -hmm. but it's a real thorn in the side of mm -hmm. Donald Trump in the United States. So where will, does that leave us as we're waiting for the Gretas of the world mm -hmm. to be old enough to vote and to run for office? Yeah. Yeah, I think what she's calling the, the current uh, leaders to is action. You know, there's been a lot of talk um, and there's, it's politicized, of course, but we need to act. And she's reminding us that there's an urgency to action. And I agree with her on that. Uh, what gets a little tricky is the details of how then should we act. And there's a huge spectrum. Um, we're on one part of that and the government is on a totally different Part and then there's business in the middle of that, That's right. you know, and then there are parties that have emerged. Uh, I think about the, the four front runners at mm -hmm. this point, uh, and that includes the Green Party. We have NDP, we have Liberal, we have Conservative. Mm -hmm. The two of them have track records from governing the country in the past, but the other two don't. What do you think needs to be on their to-do list mm -hmm. uh, for Canadians? And, mm -hmm. you know, we are the guardians of green here in Canada. Mm -hmm. Definitely. So uh, I was looking through, McLean's has a great website on all the different commitments and promises so far. Uh, and what's great about what I saw there was every single party wants to do something around environment and climate change. So that's good news. Um, when we look at the two conservative and liberal parties who have been in power, um, there's a couple things from the liberals and there's a whole list from the conservatives. And again, it's about how we go about uh, trying to achieve the future we hope for, for the good of people and for the good of all creation. And as in everything with politics, a promise is one thing, seeing it come to fruition is another. Yeah, definitely. So uh, I think on the Liberal Party, we've got promises around plastics and emissions. And on the Conservative Party, we've got promises around new technology and patents. And uh, I think all those are good and achievable. Um, I want to see the courage to do what has to be done for the next generation. You know, what if we, we made some things that we could hold each other accountable and show leadership around the world? Wouldn't that be great for the next generation? Luke Wilson, CEO of Arasha, thank you so much. And may I say, please keep up the good work. Still ahead, it dominated the election four years ago. Will Canada's care for refugees be a factor at the polls? Ann Wolger from Matthew House joins us next. I believe the government should give more focus to the immigration and refugees people because Lots of problems are happening related to that. Well, over 150 groups, including all the major faith groups, have asked all federal parties to make a clear stand on issues of immigration and refugee care for Canada. Where do they stand? Well, Ann Wolger is an expert in care for the refugee resettlement issues in Canada. Ann, thank you for being with us. Uh, let's go through all of the parties quickly. And so I'm going to just start with the Conservatives because here's, you can see this on every door knocker that comes out. Uh, stop illegal border crossers from jumping the queue. That sounds like an election issue to me. Your opinion. Um, it does, <laughs> um, but I, I must say I'm quite disturbed by reading that kind of statement because there's such misinformation in it. Um, refugee claimants are not illegal. 
So to name them illegal, once again, it's showing disrespect. They are legally entitled to enter Canada. Canada has signed an international treaty called the Geneva Convention. So they're not illegal. And Anyone they should... Anyone can show up at any border when you've signed the Geneva Convention, including Canada's. Correct. So Correct. the fact that they show up at a border is... But what about this idea of queue jumping? Yeah, I think that's also a, a really unfair way to um, describe them because there actually is no queue for refugees. Um, that's, they're a totally different kettle Two of fish. Two different buckets. Absolutely, being, okay. absolutely. And those that desperately need protection should be entitled to the opportunity to request it. And thankfully they are, because thankfully Canada up till now has always recognize our obligations and honored them. Okay, so let's just quickly go through some of the other party platforms where on, on this issue of immigration. Uh, it's not as vocal as some elections as it has been. Mm -hmm. Tell us about your opinion on the what the NDP are, are, are saying about this. Um, <clears throat> excuse me, from my understanding so far, um, I know that they're definitely in support of the eradication of the Safe Third Country Agreement, which Personally, as one that's seen it before and after in the last 30 years working with refugees, I think that stance is a very wise one um, because we need to give everyone the opportunity to have protection that is requesting it. And um, it yeah. worked better before, before the Safe Third Country, and I, I know it, it will work better. And the Liberals. The Liberals, um, I mean, in general, they have been trying to honor our principles. They wanted to bring in more refugees um, than others. Um, I think they, they've been trying to, um, they've invested a lot more money into our system to ensure that uh, we have a, yeah, to our refugee protection the, the waiting determination yes. system. And so I, I feel that they're definitely, you know, trying um, very earnestly to support refugees and also to honor our, our international obligations. We have been exploring the faith-based concerns in this federal election and the fact that over 150 groups have written to the parties asking that immigration, that refugee care be part of it. Remind us why this issue matters so very much to people of faith. I think the most powerful story of all is Jesus um, um, the parable of the Good Samaritan. When you think of it, that, that victim that the Samaritan helped was very much like a refugee, someone who had been attacked, who had been harmed. And that Samaritan didn't do a security check, didn't do any kind of check. He just <laughs> helped the person, brought them to an inn, probably even kept them in his own you know, room, bandaged his wounds. And then the really powerful thing that a lot of people forget is he then paid for him. Okay, and nothing like Ann Wolger to remind us that this is an election issue, care for the vulnerable, an election issue. Thank you for being part of championing refugee care in Canada. We'll be back after this. Well, we'll be back with more election coverage two weeks from now for faith-filled issues in the campaign. But Anne, your first show with us. Delighted. It was such a pleasure, and I look forward to many, many more. Next week, you are covering the Bahamas. Yeah. I'm going to be on assignment in the, in the States, but uh, we've got a great show next week. It is all about the Bahamas recovery, recuperation. You have an exclusive interview with a survivor. All right, so join us again next week and much more on our website. Bye-bye then. Thank you all.